Good evening, everyone, and you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, which has been brought to you tonight by the advisory staff here in County Mayo. My name is Brendan Gary. I work in Chagas and Ballinrobe, and tonight, for the next hour, I'm delighted to be your host. Now, tonight, the focus switches to farm succession planning, and every year, lots of farms uh, complete the changeover from one generation to the next, and there are many issues to consider when planning a farm transfer. So tonight, we'll discuss these issues, and tonight, our guest speaker will be James McDonnell, who is a farm management specialist based in Chagas and Oak Park. And James will give us some valuable information in relation to succession planning. While later, local education officer Aina Lucre from Chagas and Ballinrobe will outline the benefits of completing the agricultural green cert with Chagas Mayo and the various course options. And later, after the presentations, we'll have a short interactive poll. Now, you, the viewers, are being encouraged to engage with our speakers here tonight. And we ask you to type your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of our screens. And later, as usual, Vivian Silk, the Chagas Regional Manager here in County Mayo, will put your questions live to our panellists here tonight. So please type your questions into the Q&A box. Now, this webinar is being recorded. It will be available to watch back in the coming days on our Chagas Mayo YouTube channel. And we'd encourage you to check out our Chagas Mayo YouTube channel there for all the other uh, webinar episodes and indeed uh, previous videos that were made locally. So without further delay, I'm now going to ask uh, James McDonnell to start sharing his presentation with us. And it's over to you now, James. Thanks, Brendan. I assume you can you can see my screen okay. So that's, um, that's perfect, James. Yeah. So yeah. over to you now. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. Thanks for the, the invite to, to talk to um, your clients here this evening. So hopefully over the next 15 or 20 minutes or so that you'll get some useful information um, from me that, that you can use when you sit down to do your, your succession plans. Um, so just move on to the next slide. Oh, yeah. OK, so what I'm really going to do over the next 15, 20 minutes is I'm going to, I suppose, um, go through where you can get help because succession inheritance is quite a complex area. And um, I'm also going to maybe highlight some key areas maybe that, that you should focus on. So um, I suppose to define, we hear succession inheritance and farm transfer and really what did they mean? And I suppose succession is really the gradual transfer of management of a business from one generation to the next. Inheritance is about the legal ownership uh, transfer from one generation to the next. And we could look at a farm transfer as maybe a combined version of uh, succession and inheritance together. So sometimes, you know, succession might happen a number of years before inheritance might actually happen. So it could be there could be a number of steps to the process. So that might actually help uh, you actually work through, you know, your own family situation. Sometimes it all happens together, but sometimes maybe the best option is to do it over over a number of steps. Um, I'm not going to be able to transfer a massive amount of information to you over, you know, the course of this talk. So um, afterwards, if you type the words Chagask and succession, into Google, it'll bring you to our farm succession and inheritance webpage. And on that page, you'll find a booklet that you can download called The Guide to Transferring the Family Farm. There's also a workbook that you could use to write your own farm succession plan. Um, I won't get you to read or, or, or uh, write down the website, just it's easier to Google. So Google Chagask uh, Farm and succession and it bring you to the page. There's a number of videos that um, we published over the last couple of years where we go into more detail on legal issues, um, maybe pension issues and uh, farm partnerships. So I think there's three different videos that you could look on. There's, so there's about two hours of video view and that, that goes into more detail on some of the areas I'm going to look at in this quick talk. Just in terms of financial supports, what's the government and what's the EU doing in terms of um, farm succession? So there are some good incentives out there. So it's worth knowing these. Um, so if we look at, you know, basic payments that opened uh, today. So you could now actually make an application. And for young people that are starting off in farming, there is a payment that you can you can get over a number of, of years. Um, it's called the Young Farmer Scheme. It's currently worth about 68 euros uh, as a top up on entitlements for up to five years. But we're now at the end of a, a cap and there's a new one starting next year. And that payment is increasing to somewhere between 160 and 190 euros per hectare, up to a max of 50 hectares. 
hectares. So if we look at the average farm in Ireland at around 30 hectares, it could deliver five grand a year for five years. So it's a nice incentive, you know, to start uh, young people off and it might cover legal expenses and, you know, other costs associated with transfer. So that's good. Where there are no entitlements, uh, it is possible for young people to go to a national reserve where you're, you're given an average value entitlement. So the current ar annual average value is worth 180 euros. And if you were to get that this year and get a green in payment on top of it, it brings you up to 250 euros plus to 68. So you're at over 300 euros per hectare. So it's a nice incentive to help getting young people started off. There's also the other incentive if you're taking over a farm, um, people taking over generally look to develop the business. So to look for a grant aid for maybe uh, building slatted sheds or doing other types of investments. So there's a TAMS grant. So it's 60 percent for for young trained farmers as against 40 percent for everybody else. Registered farm partnership grant. So maybe you're not going to do all the steps uh, together. You're going to do maybe um, some succession before you do the inheritance. So that maybe the older generation and the younger generation start farming together in a registered farm partnership. So there's a grant available to cover up to 50% of the costs associated with setting that up. So they're the EU uh, type grants. And then if we look at our own government policy, there's a number of tax reliefs. So there's stamp duty relief for young trained farmers. There's agricultural relief against capital acquisitions tax. There's stock relief against income tax. And there's a succession farm partnership income tax credit. Uh, which, you know, helps, uh, I suppose, reduce the tax bill when there's two partners farming together, where ultimately there will be a farm transfer over the course of the partnership. So who can uh, you go to help? So I went on Google Maps and I took a picture of the Ballon Robe office. So this might be your first port of call where you go and talk to, um, to Brendan and Aina. Uh, so your local advisor. So you can talk to them about the cap entitlements, what EU schemes that you could avail of, um, how you go about moving herd numbers. Is collaborative farming an arrangement that maybe you should be looking at? Or if you have some general questions around farm transfer in relation to courses and you know qualifying for some of the, the reliefs, there are education uh, requirements. So you could talk to the education officers. And maybe part of the farm transfer maybe Forestry has been looked at as an option. So there are forestry advisors uh, that can help deal with those kind of queries. So uh, you could start with the local Chagas office. But there's a number of other professionals that can also uh, help you out. So when a farm has been transferred, there are tax returns that need to be made. So there are capital taxes. So we're talking about capital acquisitions tax, capital gains tax, and stamp duty. When you're actually doing the, the farm transfer, you know, you're transferring assets. So that's a legal job. So solicitors will be involved. Um, so they can start with maybe you writing a will or if there are certain benefits you want to confer to other parties in the family. Maybe there's some legal security that, that you want to um, have as part of, of the transfer. So maybe you retain and write a residence in the farmhouse or something like that. So solicitors will deal with that area. Citizens information are a very useful service. They're funded by the Department of Social Protection and they can give advice on the fair deal scheme, maybe pension, um, what kind of a pension you might be entitled to and what other entitlements the state can benefit, uh, give you when, when you uh, reach certain ages and maybe when you're, you're stepping back from, from farming. So very useful service. Um, those kind of questions, the Department of Social Welfare don't take directly. So they have funded citizens information to provide this information to you. In terms of, you know, uh, what pension you're entitled to, you may need to contact the Department of Social Protection directly to figure out, have you, do you know what your PRSI payment history is? So you can use that information to have a chat with citizens information. Sometimes everything doesn't go smoothly and you might know where to start the conversation, or maybe you need help because there's a roadblock in, in the, the farm communications. So mediation can be a very useful service. So the Mediators Institute of Ireland have recommended mediators. And if you go onto that website, you can get in touch with one that can help uh, start the conversation. And another profession you may not think of is the auctioneers. So when you're doing capital tax um, returns, so these three taxes that I mentioned already, you need to have valuations of the property so that the tax, the tax returns can be made. 
So everything um, that's involved may need to be valued. So that's where the auction year comes into play. Um, I suppose the starting point for most people is, you know, um, and we'll do a poll on it later, um, you know, the, the, the farm owner or the current farmer, has he or will made or, or she? Um, the thing is, if you die and you don't have a will made, well, then the state decides how your assets are distributed. So if you want to make that decision yourself, that's done through a will and are cheap enough to, to make. So it's a matter of making an appointment with a solicitor, writing a will, and let that be a, a backstop, as we heard lots of, of, of that word being used around um, the Brexit. So the will is ultimately a backstop. So what happens if the un unforeseen happens? So you can have that in, in your will until you have your, your full succession plan done. And if there's no will, well, then the intestacy laws uh, take, take precedence. And um, that's decided as per the 1965 Succession Act. I think at the time the Minister for Justice was, was the famous Charles J. Hawhey. So he was involved in, in, writing, in writing the Succession Act. Um, so I'm, I'm now going to look at a list of family questions maybe that you might ask yourselves or your family. So the first one I've covered, do you have a will? The second one might be, have you had a discussion with your family or is there, you know, is there, telepathic, um, you know, is a discussion taking place in, in people's heads, but not actually out in the open. Um, so communication is the key to getting all this right. Succession is not the easiest thing to do. Do all the family members know their position? So sometimes it's, it's unsaid, but maybe uh, John went off to work in Dublin and John has bought a house. I'm sure John is fine. Mary has stayed at home, so Mary is getting the farm. So there's nothing said. So really, all of this needs to be out in the open and we need um, you know, to have this conversation so that everybody is on the right page and then there'll be no conflict. Something that's useful maybe is a personal affairs checklist. So we have one on our website. So when you get to the, the farm succession page, scroll down and you can download this. So it might be it might contain a list of, you know, maybe uh, the numbers of bank accounts, maybe where the family heirloom is kept, what music you want played at your funeral so it's kept in the house or kept nearby so that um when the, the 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 event happens that you pass away that somebody can pick it up and they know uh where your affairs are who the solicitor is um you know the family heirloom where that's kept and you know so it's a very useful document and if nothing else if you just read it it can form a useful checklist that you can use for uh, going through um, farm succession and, and inheritance. Another question might, you might ask yourself, have you made provision for long, long term care should you need it? So, um, you know, dementia is, is getting common and um, maybe you might lead uh, long term care. So have you thought about that? You know, um, not everybody passes away suddenly and, you know, that's that's the easy way to go and it's the way people maybe want to go. but. If you end up needing care and your family aren't around to care for you, how are you going to fund that? So that's something that, that needs careful uh, thought about. In terms of the future income, so with farm succession, there's two sides. There's the parents and the children. Um, and, you know, west of Ireland, I'd say a lot of farms are small, so it's probably not possible to have two incomes from the one farm. But the two generations do need some income. So um, are the people currently farming making the PRSI payments, even if the farm income is low? Uh, if you're making the payments, they do entitle you to a state contributory pension. If you're not, well, then you're on to the means tested pension. So that's worth looking into. And you need to have made a certain number of payments before you qualify for the full PRSI pension. Do you have a pension plan? And I know maybe there's lots of, of part-time farmers in, in, in the West. So maybe there's pension to do with, you know, work. Um, that's grand if you're in a, in a state job like, like we are on, on the, this side of the table tonight. But maybe you're um, a plasterer or an electrician or, you know, you're a trade. Do you have a pension plan? Um, have you been paying into one? So it's worth taking a look at. Um, not just from the, the farm side, but from, from an income point of view in the future. Another question that you might ask yourself or your family, have you discussed the tax implications of succession? 
sometimes you find that um, a family goes into a solicitor and they do the transfer and then some short time later they realize that there's a tax bill due because they didn't look at the tax implications. So I think it's more important to work out what the plan for the family should be, first of all, look at the tax implications of that. And if there are no tax implications, well, then you can go ahead to the solicitor. But if there are tax implications, well, how do you reduce the tax to zero or mitigate it um, so that there's less tax before you sign on the dotted line? Are there any risks to the succession plan? So every family is different. Maybe you might do a plan a certain way and then something happens, you know, maybe uh, it was the wrong plan to do. So you need to think about the unforeseen um, or the unintended consequences. Um, if we look at the farm business, will the business still be viable when the succession plan has been implemented? So sometimes you find that one member of the family is given the farm, but they have to pay a figure of money to other siblings. And it means that the person getting the farm has to take out a loan. And that might use the, the repayment capacity that that person has. And maybe there's no money left then to develop the farm. So if the farm can't be developed, that creates a viability problem. So we need to be very careful, you know, uh, if you're transferring the farm to one sibling where they have to make a payment to other siblings. You know, you're, you're trying to give them a business that will give them an income but maybe the business needs to be developed. So it's, it's, it's just one that we've seen uh, where there have been some problems along, the, along um, those lines. So we just need to be careful that everything is possible and, and viable. Can you list, list any risks that could affect uh, the farm business in the future? You know, so it might be that there's a lot of development that needs to be done and that could be a risk to the business, can it afford it? Have you discussed the plan with your legal representative? So it's important maybe to have a discussion with the solicitors before you actually sign on the dotted line, get some advice there and then come back to the family. Maybe different members of the family should each have their own solicitor and have separate discussions. Um, another big one might be, you know, the cost of implementing the transfer. So depending on, you know, who's getting the farm, what kind of work they're involved in, um, is there going to be a cost? If there's no education, there could be a stamp duty cost. Um, so it's worth looking at that as well. You know, solicitors and accountants and auctioneers will have their own costs. So you can get a quotation and you can total it all up to see what's involved. Um, one of the big questions we, all, we often get asked is, will, there, will the plan result in a tax liability? Um, so there are three taxes involved capital acquisitions tax, capital gains tax and stamp duty. In the vast majority of cases where, you know, the young person is going to be actively farming and the older generation have been farming prior to transfer, there, there, there's generally no tax. Um, but if the timing is wrong, uh, there could be capital acquisitions tax and stamp duty. Um, they're generally the first two that come into play. It's rare enough that you come across a case where there's actually capital gains tax, but all three taxes are important because the rates are, are quite high. So if, if there is going to be a tax liability, are there options to, to reduce the leakage to tax? Because the last thing you want to do is transfer a farm to a child and they have to sell a couple of fields to clear the tax bill. Um, some other questions maybe that you might ask uh, in your family discussion. Are you aware of all the dates and age limits? So Aina will mention age 35 and maybe age 40, depending on the scheme or, or the tax law. Do the successors meet all the educational and time requirements? So there are active farmer conditions associated with some of the reliefs available against tax. So they're important. Maybe there is no successor. And uh, we'll ask that question in the poll later on. So if there is no successor and, and you know you feel you're not fit to continue farming, there are other options out there. So maybe land leasing might be an option and they hear good money available for land at the moment. Share farming is another option where you partner up with, with somebody else where uh, you're sharing the, the work and sharing the profits. Um, that's generally used in, in, on tillage farms, but it can work in, on, on grassland farms. Um, registered farm partnerships is another option. 
and maybe forestry is a final option where you can you might plant some of of your land maybe the land that's more suitable to forestry while you might lease other parts of, of the farm and you get a tax-free income from forestry so that's also an option um so just just to finish up um you know there's a lot of time involved in uh, trying to put a succession plan in place and it's always better to go early than too late because when you're too late you might end up with the large tax bill so i would say better go three hours too soon than than a minute too late so um i hope that um you've got something from this uh, i know brendan said it's 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 recorded so if you missed some of the questions you can have a read back over it and if there's any simple questions there i can i can take them now or, or later on in the in the forum thank you very much james and look at that's an excellent presentation and indeed look at uh, james we will come back to you for questions i see a lot of questions coming in and uh, we have a huge number of farmers on this evening so i'd encourage you to put your questions in there and uh, we'll have good time for questions uh, later on so at this stage of the evening now i'm just going to uh, ask my colleague Aina lucre there from chagas and ballinrobe to start sharing his presentation with us and uh, just to remind you again you can keep putting your questions in there and we will come back to you at the end when vivian uh, comes on and Vivian will put the questions to our panelists. So over to you now, Aina. You can see my, my screen there, Brendan, can you? I can indeed, yeah, that's perfect. Now, thanks very much, Aina. That's brilliant. Okay, so uh, I'll be covering the benefits and delivery options uh, for the Chagas Green Start course, and um, courses that we deliver here in Ballinrobe and in, indeed Ballina as well. So a little bit about the education program um, that we're running here in the Mayo region. We have two regional education centres, one here in Ballinrobe and one in Ballina. And I suppose such is the demand of the Green Star course in recent years. We're currently running six courses um, from these centres with help from facilities such as the Ball Resource Centre um, and, of course, our host farm, farms and farmers as well. And I suppose a few less lesser used facilities such as the, the Mayo Sligo Mart there in Ballina and the Ballina, Ballina Road Race Course um, where, we, where we might run some skills there, tractor driving skills. Uh, so there's a lot of stakeholders involved in running the, the Green Star course here in Mayo uh, and a lot of involvement, involvement from the wider community. Um, so the Green Cert or the specific purpose certificate in farming um, like we, we have two, we have two courses to choose from here in the Mayo region, uh, and then you have the third, I suppose, option, which is the, the ag colleges, um, going to one of the ag colleges. Um, so we have the distance education course and we have the part time course. Uh, both are for adults over twenty three, uh, and then the ag colleges is for anyone who is under twenty three looking to complete the Green Cert course, and we have. Of course, I suppose Mount Bellew, Belly Hayes, and Gurchine are probably some of the, the closer ag colleges that you'd you'd be looking at. Um, so looking first at the the distance education course, um, you you'll need a QQI uh, level six to apply for this course. What do I mean by that? So that's an apprenticeship or a, a level six cer certificate of some sort. And the reason for this is there's a lot of self-directed learning uh, in this course. And what I mean is there's a greater responsibility for the student uh, to study in their own time. Uh, not as much contact time as the part-time class. Uh, you might have about between 20 and 25 contact days uh, over about 18 months. There can be some variation in the total time taken. But generally, in Mayo, it takes about 18 months to complete. Uh, and for the student, that translates to about a day or two a uh, month contact time, which could be online, could be on farm, uh, could be in the classroom. And hopefully, going forward, we'll have a, a bit more class, classroom time. Um, this course is not as such an online course. There is a nice bit of contact days or contact hours, but um, I suppose the best term to use to describe this course will be a blended, blended learning model uh, where we try to facilitate the learner as much as we can uh, and 
that the theory is covered online and the skills stays are delivered on farm or in the office. Uh, and I suppose we're trying to move back to a more for, familiar routine um, these days. So there's obviously going to be skills, exams, practicals and assignments. There's a, they're all part of the course. And that's, I suppose, some of the content that students will be ex expected to cover. Uh, so what is the, cer the certificate? It's a level five certificate in agriculture and a level six certificate in agriculture. And com combined, even though we look at it as, I suppose, the most common term used is the green cert, um, you'll need both of these certificates to draw down grants. So essentially the green cert is uh, the level five and level six combined. Um, the part-time option then, um, so it's the same as the distance education course in the sense that it's the level six and level five certificate combined. Uh, it has in, in, in the regional programs, it has minimum age requirement of 23 years of age. And it differs, differs from the distance course in the contact hours. So with a part-time course, we look to complete, complete it in two to two and a half years. Um, and this kind of translates to a day a week. And this has always, I suppose, been done during the week. Uh, I suppose before there have been, I suppose, evening classes. Uh, and I suppose gen generally uh, people, there, there was a greater demand for the, the, day, the day courses. Um, even though people had to op around, operate around work, uh, it, it tended to work well. Uh, so there's more contact time than the distance course uh, in the part-time course. And uh, the part-time course is paced accord accordingly. So what that means is we leave more time for the students to discuss and draw out topics in class. And uh, often you'd hear maybe students, I suppose, saying that, that they learn something from one of their colleagues or one of their, their fellow students in class. And it, I suppose it's a good way to build up relationships in the community as well. Um, it's, 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 we just have more time in class in the part-time course. And it's, it's one of the big advantages of the part-time course. It's, it's just slower paced. So the course benefits. So I suppose the course benefits, in our opinion, starts with strong delivery of skills, um, giving students a strong foundation in areas such as animal husbandry and land use management. Most of the students availing of the course are from beef and sheep, sheep backgrounds here in Mayo, um, but there is a certain amount of dairy students as well. So our delivery, our delivery of skills uh, will, will vary depending on the needs of the students and we try to, we try to facilitate uh, as inter I suppose an interesting course for the students and try to keep students engaged. Exposure to excellent local farms is probably one of the strongest areas of the course um, where we show model farms uh, to the students or in the students locality which is I suppose great for the students as they can relate to these farms more so than some of the larger college farms so we, we really get into the community and I suppose there's good role models there already and we, we take advantage of these. So I suppose no farmer farms the same way and the students are exposed to different methodologies to achieve in best practice. Um, students are shown how to farm safely and minimizing risk to themselves and others. And of course, there's a big emphasis on sustainability and environmental or environmental issues these days. And our students are shown how to farm sustainably and environmentally friendly with a greater focus on carbon friendly farming. Um, and of course, this course uh, looks to set students up to make the best attempt at making a living from farming. Um, a lot of students work part time. Uh, and we know the importance of a good work life balance and ensuring facilities are set up uh, on farms so students can farm safely on their own farms. Uh, and of course, this is also reflected in the selection of host farmers uh, we bring students out to. So they, they, they often come away with uh, good ideas for, for their own farms as well after the, the farm visits. Um, training in the com 
computer skills and farm financial management skills is an important aspect of the course. There are a lot of products out there that people can use, um, like the Profit Monitor or Cost Control Planner. Uh, so we ensure students have a good knowledge of these products leaving the course. Um, through this course, we, we hope students learn to develop their leadership skills, group skills, presenting skills, uh, and interview skills, which are all becoming more and more important in today's world. And these qualities are, I suppose, nurtured in discussion groups on bench, benchmark farms. Um, so just, I suppose, James would have touched on a few of these earlier, and I'll just give a, a brief overview of them. So there's, I suppose, the other benefits, uh, I suppose you have the traditional revenue or tax benefit of doing the green cert. And of course, uh, this was stamp, let's say the stamp duty relief for young trained farmers. Um, and I'm just going to highlight these. I'm not going to uh, delve into them too much, but it's important people know that, that they're there. So you have the stamp duty uh, on the transfer of land, and this is at about 7.5%. And young trained farmers can get full relief on that, which can be very beneficial. Uh, you have an enhanced stock relief, which is 100% compared to the standard 25% stock relief. And this applies to, I suppose, farmers in their first four years of farming where a person is under 35 years of age. Uh, succession and partnership tax credit, which applies to people less than 40 years of age. Um, I suppose, as James was highlighting earlier, it's important to note there's variation in the maximum age limits depending on what is being applied for. So you must always check, uh, check first with, with a professional or with your ag consultant or solicitor or accountant. Uh, agricultural relief from capital acquisitions tax is something to watch out for, which is charged on the transfer of land. So farmers have to pass, I suppose, the farmer test, which is 80% of their assets are agricultural assets, um, as well as being defined as an active farmer. So they must spend at least 50% of their working time on farm or be a young to train far trained farmer. So that there again is another benefit of the, the green search. It, uh, you don't necessarily have to spend 50% of your time, uh, I suppose 50% of your time working on farm if you are a young trained farmer with the green cert. Uh, consignuity relief, uh, which is a means if the farm is being transferred and the, uh, the transferee or whoever is receiving the land is over 35, they can still avail of the stamp duty relief. Uh, there cur currently isn't an age limit on it. Uh, there was before, um, but there, there isn't now. And I suppose there's possibly other benefits as yet unknown. So what, what does that mean? The cap is coming out, our new cap is uh, next year, and look, re revenue or revenue as well might, might, I suppose, add little bits to this or add different um, release this, and some of them are yet unknown. So. Um, potential benefits from the department's point of view. Uh, straight away from my slides, you'll see the age of 40 is there, uh, is, is the important age, not 35. Uh, young farmers, the young farmer scheme allows farmers to get a top up payment on their basic payment, and you have to be less than 40 and have the green search. So James touched on that as well, I think. Uh, you may be able to get an allocation of new entitlements or a top up on current entitlements to the national average value. Once again, you have to be less than 40 and have the green cert and new entrants will, will be given priority. Uh, you have the 60% grant in TAMS. Uh, once you're in your, in your first five years of farming, uh, which is a top, up, a top up on the standard 60% grant. Once again, there could be other benefits in the in the coming cap that we don't yet know of. So it's it's always good to keep that in mind. Um, further information, whenever you're going about applying for tax reliefs or grant aid, it's usually important to involve professionals such as ag consultants, accountants, solicitors to get their opinions and views. And James was touching on this earlier as well. Chagas have uh, transferring the family farm booklet available online or indeed hard copies can be got in local offices. And there's, an, there's a few excellent transferring the family farm online events that were held over 2020 and 2021. 
and they can be found on the Chagas YouTube page. Okay, so just going back to the course um, and how it's delivered, it's a mix of practical time and lecture time. Uh, we'll be assessing modules via skills, practicals, exams, and projects. Practicals will be on, on farm or in the office where we'll demonstrate skills to students. Project work is, of course, part of the course. Uh, exams will be held in offices. Sometimes we use uh, the Bal Resource Centre there as well. Uh, skills will be done indoors and out uh, on farms in the region, which is a great resource for us locally as students get to see how farmers in their own locality operate. Uh, we book venues as well, such as Sli the Sligo Mayo Mart uh, for some dr tractor driving skills and some sometimes the Ballon Ball uh, race course. So help and support, I suppose. We, we want to help everyone to pass the course and ensure everyone has a fair chance to do so. Uh, so we can provide scribes, readers, and maybe more specific help if needed once you let us know. Uh, we help students every year and there's no reasonable request for help declined. Most problems have a solution. So just make sure you tell your tutor or whoever your contact is um, if you require help. So I'm just going to have a quick look at the actual module so you know what's involved in the course. Um, and th this hopefully will give you a better idea. Uh, so the level five consists of the following modules. You have the principles of agriculture, farm safety, farm assurance, soils and the environment, work practice, farm business and technology, safe use of, of pesticides, communications, beef production, grass production, sheep production, and chemical fertilizer application. Um, and these, these modules, I suppose, make up the core of the course and aim to provide students with an excellent knowledge, knowledge of modern technologies and principles used in agriculture today. Um, and I suppose the, the second half of the list of modules there contain a more practical element of the course and aims to equip students with the knowledge needed to excel in their careers in agriculture. And you can see, I suppose, beef production, grass production, they're, they're, they're well delivered in the region and um, Students generally have good comments on them. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so now we have the level six, which builds on the level five. So we have work practice, farm management and business planning, farm performance measurement, and sustainability farming in the environment. Sorry, as well as grass management and applied livestock breeding. Um, these modules uh, make the student look at their own farms a bit more. And there's more project work involved here. And we try to get students to put the theory they have learned into practice. And um, so there's, there's very practical elements to, to the level six. So the course fees and um, the current, if you have a, a level six course, you will probably, probably be eligible for the distance education course. And that's 2,990 euros. Um, the current fee for the part-time course is 1,700 euros. But if for some reason uh, you opted for the part-time course and you have a level six, uh, have a level six award already, there's an additional fee of 1,000 euros. And this is because you've previously completed a level six course and you would have availed of capitation before. So I suppose that's just one thing to note there. If you do have a level six course, our course completed, you should gravitate maybe towards the distance course. Uh, fees can change, so just always make sure you, 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 you inquire. So progression. <coughs> so a lot of people return home uh, and maybe go part-time farming, but there is, there is an option to add a few more credits to the green cert we offer and complete an advanced cert, cert in agriculture. And from there, you can progress on to maybe completing a level seven degree or even a level eight degree. Uh, and indeed, uh, we, we have uh, advisors in Chagas who started that way and they, they completed the, the, level, the, the level eight degree and started with the green search. So look, if you have any questions, email Cora Owens at cora.owens at chagas.ie. She's um, the education administrator in Mayo and is very good for answering queries. Um, or indeed 
contact any of the numbers given at the start of the presentation. So I think that's it there, Brendan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aina. Now that's ex excellent. Um, so indeed, at this stage now, I'll just get you to stop sharing your presentation, Aina, if that's okay. And um, so just for one moment or two, I'm just going to just um, just going to launch a short little poll that we have um, put together there for this evening, just to try and gauge the interest and just to gauge some some of the insights in relation to our viewers this evening. So um, uh, it's going to be four short questions. And the first question is there is, as James mentioned, do you have a will made on your farm? So we have a lot of farmers on this evening. So hopefully, look at this is something that um, we hope will make, will make an impact. So you should be able to hopefully uh, get viewing now at this stage and maybe get some uh, results in. So do you have a poll made and you have a yes or no option there? Do you intend to complete a farm transfer in 2022? So as James said, look at uh, basic payment is open today and the, the window is starting to you know, get shorter from, from every day now until the 16th of May. So uh, a number of things need to be completed. And again, it's a yes or no answer there for that. Do you have an identified farm successor? So indeed, uh, many people, I suppose, look at have and many people may not have. So again, it's a yes or no answer there. And finally, uh, as Ian mentioned there, uh, does your successor have the green cert completed if you have a nominated successor? So what we will do, look at it, we will leave the poll running for a minute or two, for a few minutes. And at this stage, um, we will maybe come back to Vivian. I can see at this stage that um, 40, 50 percent of the viewers this evening have voted already. So we leave it running for another few more minutes. And um, at this stage of the evening, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, call on our regional manager here, uh, Vivian Silk, to put our questions uh, that you've put in this evening. And we still have some time for questions. So please type your questions in there to the Q&A tab. And uh, it's over to you now, Vivian. Thanks, Brenda. Let Aina catch his breath there for a minute. There's plenty of questions uh, at the minute, folks, and there's room for more, so get typing there when you've the poll finished. James, the first question for you, and I know there was changes there in the last couple of years on this. Regarding the young farmer scheme, if you were a high higher earner, so you're in the 40% tax bracket, are you still eligible for, for a grant? Yeah, the young, the young farmer scheme, uh, There's no, there are no income limits around the young farmer scheme. There was an income limit around the National Reserve, all right, but that has been removed for 2022. Okay, okay thanks, James. Um, so it just means that when you get the grant, you're in the higher tax bracket, you, you pay more. Okay, okay, thanks, James. Um, next one, James, is, is related to... Can you to, hear me okay? Yeah, you're kind of coming in now, small bit. Yeah. Is that okay, Brendan? Can you... Yeah, just yeah. about, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Be, yeah. Come in, notice more with James, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, next question is uh, in, in relation to, um, to, to, to uh, I suppose, inheritance and so on. So the question, and I don't fully understand it, maybe you do, James. What about putting assets into a foundation that leaves the next generation safe um, from marriage breakup in the future with, with no tax to be paid? Can you, can you decipher that one, James? Yeah, I can. I, I might turn off my video. The line might be clearer. Um, okay. What I would say in, in relation to uh, farms being transferred and when, when you're worried about, um, you know, what might happen with the next generation, I would say don't transfer the farm until you're happy that whatever the next generation does with it or whatever happens to their marriage, that you can live with the consequences of that. So you can't kind of rule from beyond the grave or from beyond. Once you give it, you can't take it back. So some people would look at putting land into trust or, or maybe, um, you know, transferring the land to the grandchild, uh, but the parent has the use of it for their life. So there's different things that people can do. But I would say on the whole, once you're happy that you can uh, live with the consequences of whatever the child does with the farm when they're given it, I think that's the safest uh, place to go. Okay, and the next question is more or less directly related to that, and you alluded to your answer there, James. What are the implications if farm inheritance was to skip a generation? So basically, a grandfather passing it on to a grandson or a granddaughter, indeed. Yeah, that's a... That's that's a good question, Vivian. Um, mm. I do come across cases every now and again where, you know, the, the, 
our mourner might be in their 90s and, and, and the next generation is in their 60s and they're not ready to, they don't want to farm, they want to give it to the grandchild that's 30. Um, the tax is higher. So you need to, you know, the threshold for CAT is, is 336, 35,000 for parent to child, but parent to grandchild is 32 and a half thousand. So you might decide, you might have to run it through two steps. So give it, give it to the child, but, but they might lease it directly to the grandchild. So there's a way around it, but it's not easy. So yeah, it's no, yeah. yeah. So ultimately you'd need good tax advice from an accountant or, uh, you know, someone professional for that. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks, James. Um, there's a couple of questions here. We obviously have a few, a good few female um, viewers tonight, and it's become topic at the moment. Uh, and, and I suppose we're in 2022, and there's plenty of um, relief and so on got to be got for 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 females in farming. So, what are the reliefs? What sorry? What reliefs are available for females over 40 currently doing the green search, or if any, uh, in a well, um, I suppose the release you have your 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 standard release there, anyways, such as um, was being considered an active farmer for the capital gains or capital uh, acquisitions tax. So that's it, it. That's across the board for everyone. But you you also have, I suppose, TAMs. There's TAMs there as well for um uh women in ag, but in general, the the same benefits would apply to to women and men for the green search uh, currently. So does it, the question directly relates to over 40, does that rule them out um, of a release from the green search? Is, is, that, is, that, is that a reasonable assumption to come to? Not, not, ne not necessarily. I suppose they can still be considered um, as, as a, it, it'll help them meet the active farmer, the active farmer route uh, for, for, for tax. Yeah, I suppose okay. we've been we've been just to add to that on yeah. that one there. Like there, there is a few um you know, I suppose forty I suppose is one threshold, thirty five another threshold. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, particularly I suppose with the Thames, you cannot go beyond your forty first birthday. I think James, you might confirm if that's true. Um there is, I suppose, under the National Reserve, there's no age limit. So someone, you know, could be pursuing the course, there could be a new farmer. Uh, starting out in the next number of years, and, and I know here in, in the in the region we've had uh, farmers that have been over the age of forty, uh, male and female, and they have successfully drawn down money uh, under the National Reserve. Uh, not so much the young farmer scheme; mm -hmm. there's a limit on that scheme. Um, but there has been a rule change in 2017 that if someone started farming uh, before their fortieth birthday, and uh, they could qualify under the young farmer scheme if they're over forty. James, you're there. Is, is, am I right on that, James? Can you hear me, James? Yeah, so the, so the rules around the National Reserve are tricky enough. So it, it, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we um, can. Yeah. The rules around the National Reserve are tricky enough. So it's about when did you start farming? Um, yeah, so if, 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 you, if you went in the herd number and applied for basic payment before your age 40, you may not have applied for the National Reserve itself. So you could be 42 or 43 and you still get National Reserve. It's about when you started. So it's about careful reading of the terms and conditions of the scheme. Um, the other thing you mentioned there, with capital acquisitions tax, there are active farmer conditions. So if you're over 40 and you have the green cert, well, you just have to farm. Um, but if you don't have the green cert, you have to farm more than 50% of your normal time. So there are benefits, you know, some benefits uh, for the over 40s. And um, generally, though, policy is aimed at the younger people. But yeah. Okay, you've just kind of noticed the next question, James, there, and I hope you can hear me okay. How do you qualify for the 80% of total assets rule for agricultural relief for the CAT when you have a, built a house on the family farm or plan to in the future? Okay, so um, the person receiving the assets, mm -hmm. it's about uh, after the transaction. So when they have received the assets, value of everything they own uh, plus everything they've received. So the total assets. So what percentage is agricultural? So if you're after, if say you, you took a gift of a site and you built a house and then subsequently you get uh, the farm. So, you know, the house is non-agricultural 
the farm is agriculture, when you value the whole lot, including maybe what cash you have in your bank account and the value of the car parked outside the front door, your total assets, if more than 80% of them are agricultural, well, then you'll qualify for the relief. Um, just on the principal private residence, if there's a fairly large mortgage, um, you can reduce the value of your principal private residence by the balance on the mortgage. So that comes into it and it makes it a little bit easier. And if you're married, um, you know, and and the house is in joint names and the mortgage is in joint names as they're so expensive to build now, the more than likely are. Um, it's half a house and half a mortgage then is what counts as the non-agricultural portion. So it's about sitting down with all your valuations and, and having a chat with an accountant, you know, to make sure that um, there's no leakage to tax and you can claim the benefit. And probably, James, might be a better idea to get, you know, the accountant involved pretty early in the whole process so that you, you have it lined up nicely. Yeah, I would always say talk, get your valuations first. Go to your accountant. Um, so when you have the plan worked out as to who's to get what, each of the children, you know, the sums need to be done for them all. And what is the tax likely to be? And if there is a fairly substantial tax, well, how do you uh, change the plan around to reduce the tax? Um, so then you make those changes to get the tax down to zero. And it's only then you go to the solicitor to sign everything up. So I think... Sometimes people go straight to the solicitor and the solicitor will do the tax return, but, you know, there can be un, unseen consequences. So the, the auctioneer and the accountant need, need to be spoken to first. Okay. Back to you, Wayne. Um, you, you, you kind of alluded to it in the previous questions that you asked. I asked, um, are women or female farmers going to get extra grants? And, and there's been a change there lately in that. Can you, can you go down to that, please? Yeah, so I suppose... Uh, women far women farmers can now, I suppose, avail of a, a, a topped up TAMS grant as well, the, the 60% TAMS grant. Um, that is such, unless Brendan, you might. Is there an know. age limit on that, guys? Is it 50? No, am I right? Is there an age limit on that, Brendan? Do you know? I think I'm it could not... be 65, I think. I think it's I know the upper was, I know there was changes there um, on that scheme, Vivian, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Mm. Uh, James, do you know it? Yeah, there is there is there is an age limit where the where the female can get the extra grant, but I'm not sure what. I they think are. I, I think it's yeah. fifty. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I'm, I'm reading I something yeah. recently. I think it's fifty for the sixty percent grant. Right. So um, I think we, we can confirm that uh, tomorrow when we answer the question properly with the email uh, replies. But yeah, I think it's yeah. I think it's fifty up to sixty percent grant up to fifty years of age for a female. Which I think uh, I think that's yeah. I think that's right. Yeah, that, that's yeah. what sticks in my head. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's something like that. The next question, folks, is related to our fees. When are the education fees to be paid for either course? I'll handle that one. If that's okay. So we take a deposit to book you into the course, um, and then before course, uh, before the course commences we we um, get the, the remaining balance of, of all course applicants because uh, it's a it's a big commitment but we want to be sure that everyone can can uh, commit to the to the course let it be the part-time or the, or, the, or the distance course so the fees I suppose direct answer to the questions fees have to be paid before the course starts it's like any college uh, course UCD UCG wherever you want to go all fees are paid before the commence the course commences so we're on the same we're on the same level with that so that's that's the center to, to that one um the next one uh possibly either Ian or, or Brendan might take it does becoming a herd keeper count as when you start farming so there's there's there's, there's two important dates uh, on that so can you just go through that one of you please you know do you want to take that one there uh yeah so does uh becoming a hard keeper um i i can take that point. yeah um because i spend a lot of time dealing with this kind of stuff in the day-to-day -day job um so the role of a herd keeper is really just uh somewhere that some person that the department can pick up the phone and telephone um so they have no ownership um, reason at all. So if a company like Chagas has, you can't just pick up the phone and ring, ring a, a legal entity. You have to ring a person. So each farm that Chagas has, there is a, set, there is a different herd keeper. Um, so farming companies all have herd keepers. Generally with normal farmers, the owner of the herd number is also the herd keeper. Sometimes, you know, a spouse or a son or daughter might take on a herd keeper role to do the paperwork for their parent. 
and that's all it is. You're more or less just a person that does the paperwork or a point of contact for the Department of Agriculture. So you haven't started farming until you put in an ER1 or an ER1.1 form uh, looking to change the ownership. That's when the start date happens. So that's important, to, to, important yeah. to make that clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next one is if you purchase land before you complete the green cert, do you still need to pay the stamp duty and claim back stamp duty after completion of the green cert? That's a common question we get asked very often. Yeah, so that's that's um, stamp duty. There's rules around paying stamp duty. So when you buy land, you have a certain number of days, depending on the time of the year, to make your stamp duty return. So if you don't have the green cert done, you pay your stamp duty. Um, once you have that payment made, I think you have up to four years to complete your green cert course. Mm -hmm. And once you have your green cert course completed within the four years, you have a further four years to seek um, to contact revenue to apply for it to be uh, claimed back or paid back to you. Yeah, and I suppose Vivian, just to add to that one, I suppose, James, the key thing there, I suppose, is that the transfer and the purchase is completed before the before the 35th birthday. Uh, if it goes, you know, if it goes after the 35th birthday, you cannot, in any case, retrospectively um, look for for stamp duty relief. And I suppose the other thing is there's a, a my farm my plan certification needed as well. Um, it's a business plan that Chagas has to certify. That's another requirement for revenue that has been introduced the last year or two. So it's just something for our viewers just to keep an eye on as well and just to be mindful of. Uh, another question here related, related to grants and TAMs. Can you claim TAMs for work carried out prior to completion of the Green Cert? Mm. I'd say you can, but it'll be at the lower rate. Am I right, uh, Brendan mm. Arena? Yeah, no. I think generally, I think it depends, I suppose, in on what way it was applied for, Vivian. If it was applied for yeah. the animal welfare nutrient storage scheme, you could be you could be caught and left at the 40%. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a, a mechanism there where if you apply under the Young Farmer Capital Investment Scheme, um, you can look for the 20% to top up um, afterwards, yeah. as far yeah. as I understand. I think is that yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's correct. You can you can apply under the Young Farmer Scheme, and if you do don't have the course completed, you can uh, submit the the sort later on and and avail the extra twenty percent. Okay, and do you have to make that clear on date of application. Uh, well, I suppose you would be because you'd be um, you'd be applying under the young farmer scheme, so you'd you'd have to upload some form of documentation saying you're you're completing the uh, that, you're in, that you're enrolled yeah. in the course, but maybe not completed yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Uh, one or two more. Now I'll just scroll up the page here. Um, just looking at the results of the poll there they're interesting okay yeah we'll, we'll share them in a minute or two yeah we'll yeah yeah just one or two more questions yeah um the question here is 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 a is a straightforward enough one is means testing involved for the young farmer scheme we kind of dealt with that earlier i presume yeah no there's no means testing no. for the young for the young farmer scheme no but there is for the national reserve or the was on yeah. there was but that has now dropped mm -hmm. Okay, so your off farm income can be limitless um, at the moment. Correct. Yeah, okay, that's, that's a help. That's a help. Okay, um, just one or two more questions. Um, is there work placement involved when people are on the Green Turf course? Or do we, do we organise that? So, Aina, maybe you take that one. Yeah, so as such, there's no work placement, but there is, you do have to, I suppose, complete two 16-week diaries between the, the level five and the level six um, sorts, let's say. So you, you have to have a farm available to you to fill out the diary and to interact with. Um, so most, I suppose, generally students use their own farm, but you may have to get get a neighbouring farm as well. Um, Okay, and the final, the final question before we finish up, folks, just came in there two minutes ago. How much of the grant covers the price of the weight scales um, in, in the, in the, in the um, mobile equipment scheme? Do you know? So if that, that, Weighing that scales for cattle, we'd say. Yeah, that, that'll depend on, I suppose, which, which you're going for. So it's 60% for a young farmer or 40% for a, a non-young farmer of the price excluding that. So mm -hmm. I think... There's a limit there of about 1,100 euros, excluding that as well. So you just have to look at the reference costs and and work work that out. Okay, thanks very much, folks. I'll hand it back to Brenda now to conclude. 
Thanks very much there, Vivian. So at this stage now, I'm just going to uh, share the res results there of our poll, uh, which you, the viewers at home this evening, uh, interact with. So uh, we can see there that um, pretty much a dead heat there, 49% of you have a will made and 51% of you don't have a will made. I think that's maybe you know an indication that there's one in every two of you there that um, you know has a call to action maybe you know in terms of completing a will. Uh, in terms of intending to complete a farm transfer in 2022, uh, it looks like there's only 14% of you tonight that's logged on that intend to make a transfer. And certainly if you're looking to complete that before the closing date of the basic payment scheme there for the 16th of May, we'd encourage you there to act, act on that uh, very, very soon because the time is running out. Um, we also asked you there uh, how many of you have an identified successor and 75% of you have an identified successor. So that's a very uh, good news story anyway. And 25% of you don't yet. So there are options, as James mentioned there, in terms of leasing and different other collaborative arrangements. And you could also talk to your local advisor or consultant on that. And finally, the last question this evening was, if so, um, if you have a successor, does your successor, successor have the green start completed? And 42% of you said they do. Uh, but more importantly, 58% of you uh, said your successor or your identified successor doesn't have the, com uh, the necessary qualifications completed. So again, look at Chagas Mayor all the time taking courses, taking names for courses, and uh, you know we can we can um, you know certainly uh, you know put your name on the list if you uh, ring your, your local Chagas office in, in any of the um, offices here in County Mayo. So uh, look at, um, I suppose at this stage of the evening, I'd like to just, uh, you know, say we're out of time and uh, we haven't got to all the questions. We have a number of questions there that Vivian and, and we will follow up on in the next coming days. Uh, I'd like to just thank our two uh, presenters here this evening, uh, James and Aina, and indeed thanks to Vivian there for handling the questions. Uh, yeah, and Brendan, sorry, just before you go, I um, was asked by my colleague to give a mention to the Sheep Conference, the Hill Sheep Conference is on okay. next Thursday night week in the... Um, Hotel in Sligo, Clayton uh, Hotel in Sligo. Yeah, just to mention that as well for any viewers that might be looking to travel. It's it's you can travel or you can watch it online, same as tonight. Perfect. Yeah, and indeed, look at thanks to you at home this evening for staying staying with us. We had a great number of farmers on, and uh, we we hope you found this webinar beneficial. And uh, we will be, be back again next week. We thought this was going to be the last uh, episode of this current series, but uh, we conducted a survey a number of weeks ago, and a number of you wanted some information in relation to renewable energy, farm forestry, and organic farming. So next week we will have a special webinar on farm forestry and renewable energy. Um, with Noel Kennedy from Chagas and Roscommon uh, talking to us about farm forestry and Barry Caslin uh, from Chagas and Longford talking to us about renewable energy. So put that in your diary for next Wednesday night, the 23rd of February at 8pm. And indeed the recording from tonight's webinar will be available to watch back on the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. So that's it for this evening, folks. Uh, it's a good night from us all here in County Mayo and see you all again next week. Bye.